Good morning and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here. Let's all stand together as we sing, I found a friend who is all to me, saved by his power divine. glad you're saved this morning say amen. amen amen i tell you what there's nothing like pillowing your head at night and knowing that you're on your way to heaven if something should happen i tell you um that gives me complete peace jesus christ will give us eternal life if we just but trust him by faith and ask him to save us he says i'll no wise cast you out and so welcome to grace baptist church this morning welcome to our online crowd as well we appreciate each and every one of you being here and we had a great and tremendous men's meeting yesterday. Uh, we had two speakers. One was uh, the senior pastor at First Baptist in Hammond, uh, Dr. John Wilkerson. And then we also have uh, on the platform with us today as well, Dr. Bob Jones III, Chancellor of Bob Jones University. He was the president of Bob Jones when I was there, and many of you uh, know him as well. It's not the first time he's been here to Grace Baptist Church by any means. And so we welcome him and his wife Karen with us today. I'll let him say more about that later. But let's ask the Lord to bless our time together as we worship him and uplift Jesus Christ in our midst. Father in heaven, we do thank you once again for all of the blessings that you have given to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for eternal life. We thank you for salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the peace that that passes to each one that knows him as our personal Savior. And Lord, I pray that you might um, meet with us here this morning. Lord, if there's one here today that does not know you as their own personal Savior, I do pray that they would understand what it means to believe in Jesus Christ, to trust in his gospel, uh, to understand what it means uh, in his death, burial, and resurrection, and the forgiveness of sins and our repentance. Lord, I pray that you might just uh, work in each heart, Lord, for Christians today, Christians who may have come in with a burden, Christians who uh, may need um, the challenge and conviction of the Holy Spirit today because they're struggling in some area. And so, Lord, we know that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray, Lord, that you would use it in our midst today. And, Lord, that we would not, um, we would not allow ourselves to uh, miss the message of the Word of God today for any other reason. Uh, Lord, may you give us rapt attention. And, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring the conviction that we need. And so, Father, we give this service into your hands. Be with Dr. Jones as he preaches this morning and tonight. Lord, I pray you just give him what we need for our hearts today. 
I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Our financial secretary has asked me to announce that your year-end giving statements for 2020 will be made available beginning next Sunday. Um, they'll be in your communication station folder. If you are watching online and can't get out, uh, just give the church office a call and uh, we'll be happy to mail you yours. All right, thank you, Pastor Warren. I appreciate so much all the work that our church did to. Um, make the men's meeting this year once again happen. Um, I've received several texts and emails, and I'll get some more this week, I'm sure, uh, from some of the men and the pastors that were here. Uh, they're always very appreciative of the work that we do. Um, I, it's 
It seems like such a short day, um, but there's three preaching services and, of course, uh, some eating in between there and uh, some fun stuff, too. So it's a great day for them. They all leave very happy, and uh, also their hearts are full, and they've made decisions, too. And so thank you to our hospitality committee who did such a great job putting on breakfast and lunch. Thank you for our ushers and for all the men of the church who helped set up the tables and chairs as well. And, of course, we had our sound crew going uh, and our uh, live stream crew. Uh, live stream crew going as well. So thank you to each and every one who made that possible. Um, people come to me and, and thank me, but it's, I, I mean, I didn't do it. Pastor Warren, his crew, all the staff, um, they take a lot of uh, responsibility to make sure things are done. And by the way, they did a tremendous job with the music as well. And so we appreciate that very, very much. They did not invite me to join them once again this year. Um, and we're still working on that. Um, aspect of the men's meeting. Um, some other announcements that um, I want to go through very quickly here. First of all, if you did not get a bulletin, there are some at the information desk here today, and I hope that you'll stop by there and grab that. There's also prayer prompters from Wednesday uh, that are left to there as well. We do have some discipleship studies on Tuesday night at 6.30 for both ladies and men. You can see that there. We also have our full slate of Wednesday activities for our young people all the way through adults. We'll be continuing our elective classes right here in the auditorium. Um, it's just one elective class right now and then in February we'll break up into other groups. There's a college hangout on Thursday at Pastor Gunther's house and then we also have a Mommy and Me play group time on Friday. Um, you can read about that. It is at the Halleck's home. That's for infants through four years old and their moms, all right? And then of course pray for the Reformers Unanimous recovery program as well. The teens have a big activity on Friday night. Uh, it's an all-nighter, nine o'clock. It starts on Friday uh, in the youth center in the gym. Um, so parents, if you have any questions about that, please see Pastor Eddie on that. Uh, there are still some offering boxes out in the lobby. I think they're at the information desk. If you have not been able to pick up your numbered offering envelopes, uh, those are at the information desk. If you don't have one, um, we can provide one for you if you would like to be a part of our blind giving program. Not giving to the blind. It's a blind giving, okay? So it's, you don't have to put your name on it. It's just a number, and um, that way you can have a record of your um, giving as well at the end of the year for tax purposes if you desire to do that. Um, also, I think we've added several different folders for some folks that have been coming through our COVID season here as well. Uh, use that communication uh, folder system that we have. Check those folders as well. You may have some cards in there that you don't know about. You may have some communication in there you don't know about. Uh, so check those often if you would please. Some of you have never um, also explored that communication folder station. Uh, there are, there are um, pens and paper and different things there for you to just jot a note to somebody. Um, it's there in the, in the drawers in that uh, piece of furniture there by the stairwell, all right? And so utilize that if you would, please. If you don't have a folder and you would like to have one, please see one of us or call the church office. We'll be glad to get you one there as well. Uh, there's a lot of other things that you can see here that is coming up. I hope that you will... Uh, uh, stay apprised of those things. Our theme for the year is walking by faith. I introduced that new theme last week, um, and I hope that you will um, continue to um, use it in your own life as well as we walk by faith here at Grace Baptist Church into this 2021 year. One more announcement that I do have, um, and don't everybody go running down there at the same time, but in the choir room uh, right now, uh, Randy Glenn has cleaned out his dad's library from the house, um, only from the house. Um, the books in his office are still there, um, but there's a ton of books, literally probably two or three tons of books. Randy was absolutely overwhelmed by how many books his dad had. And Dr. Glenn specifically said that he did not, for whatever reason, want his library going just en masse into a college library or something like that. And so um, Randy brought them here. We did give the men at the conference yesterday an opportunity to uh, go down there and sift through those books. But there are so many books on various topics. It, it's, it's absolutely overwhelming to even just look at it, okay? But you are welcome to go down there after the service, okay? Um, and go through those books. Um, uh, there's a wealth of information. Um, Dr. Glenn, of course, was well read. And Randy said uh, he didn't want a donation for it or anything like that. He just wanted us to be able to use them. 
And so what a fitting tribute it is to Dr. Glenn who read for so many years and gave that knowledge out to this church from this pulpit. And now we have the opportunity to even glean from his library. What a fitting tribute, okay? And so I appreciate that from Randy Glenn. And if you would go down there and check those books out, um, it would really be a blessing to you and would help out Randy as well. So that is down in the choir room, um, boxes upon boxes of books um, to look at and just take them if you're gonna need them or read them or give them to some grandkids or whatever the case may be, but use them if you take them. All right, let's have another song. What a privilege to come into God's presence. Bow the knee. Amen. All right, ushers, if you would come forward this morning as we receive our Sunday morning offering. And as they come, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father, Lord, thank you so much for the day you've given us, the opportunity we have to serve you, and just the freedom that we have to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the meetings we were able to have yesterday, and men from across this state to come and uh, hear God's words, God's words preached. And this morning, Lord, is... Um, Again, I pray that we'd open our hearts uh, to what you have for us, take and apply it to our lives. Pray now for this offering, Lord, as it's received, that it goes to use in the ministries here on this corner and ministries to missionaries around the world. Pray that we would be a blessing and we would give a joyous spirit. In your holy and precious name, amen. amen.
Thank you, Sandy, for that offertory. We have heard the joyful sound that Jesus saves. Let's stand together and lift our voices as we sing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. seated. At this time, my wife Liz comes to join me for a duet in a moment. All right, just before Pastor Halleck and Liz come uh, and bring the special before the message, I do want to say I hope that you read the ministry memo in the bulletin concerning a uh, little bit of history of Dr. Bob Jones III here, um, and I think he'll maybe introduce his wife here. Um, just a second, I'll leave that to him. Um, but when I went uh, down as a freshman student in 1987 uh, to Bob Jones University, um, I was relaying this to Dr. Bob last night that the chapel messages that we got while we were there, especially when he was preaching, uh, were some of the most formative things um, that I think God used in my life to make me um, into the Christian, um, if I'm anything, um, today uh, who I am. I know that God used the Word of God um, through his preaching um, to uh, chip off some of the rough edges, all right, and to um, make uh, I think some great decisions in chapel. Um, I remember those memories uh, very fondly. And so um, I always love when we can get him here. Um, like I said, he's been here over the years several different times. Uh, Dr. Glenn knew him well and um, his father as well. So um, it's with great privilege that we have him here to speak both in the morning and the evening. And I know he'll be a blessing to your heart today. And so Liz and Stephen, you come and then Dr. Bob.
It is enough that Jesus died for me. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. Thank you for your ministry. It was powerful. Thank you, choir. Beautiful song, beautifully presented. Uh, ministry of God's Word through music is um, just as essential to the uh, work of God in our hearts as the pulpit preaching. It is all the preaching. And uh, somehow some churches don't seem to get that anymore. Uh, the music of the street has become the music of the pulpit. And the message of the music of the street is a different message to a different people. And I'm glad you folks understand how strategic it is to your own soul's well-being that you have music like this in this place. Thank God for it. Joy to be here. I think the last time I was here uh, was at uh, Pastor Glenn's 40th anniversary. A lot of water under the bridge since then for all of us, hasn't it been? Uh, my wife, Beneth, was with me then. My wife, Karen, is with me now. Uh, Beneth and I were married 59 years, and God uh, decided to change her address. And she's uh, living on high today. And uh, it is not good that man should be alone. Uh, you men know that. And I beg you not to take for granted that if you live with a lady of God's choice for you as your helper, that you treasure her every day of your life. Because if God should take her, you are out to sea without a paddle. That's pretty desperate. <laughs> and how good it is, uh, how good God was to me to send Karen into my life. She taught English for 30 years at BJU. Many of your children probably had her in uh, one of their English classes. And uh, she was a friend of Venice, and so I'm happy that she can be here today and enjoy the blessings of this place. I've told her much about this place. <laughs> had a funny thing happen yesterday at the men's meeting. What a joy it was to see this place full of men, singing men. It was just great, thrilling. Felt so privileged, Pastor, that you let me come for that and for this, this day. Uh, I love this church. I loved the heritage of this place. And I love it today. It is vital. It has been a kind of a a keystone church in Bible preaching Christianity in America. Your pastor's ministry uh, and leadership in helping to keep the foundation solid in Bible preaching churches through his influence was uh, very, very important. And you, you have a heritage here that is very uncommon today. And I know you know that. And now you pray for your pastor and all the church staff leadership. Uh, keep the devil on the outside of these doors. <laughs> he doesn't belong in here. This is a sacred place where God's people meet with their God. This man came up to me yesterday from the Hammond group. He said, now, uh, do you have any relationship to this fellow Jones that We've heard about from time to time, uh, are, are you somehow related to that Jones? I said, yeah, he was my grandfather. And, and uh, he founded the college 94 years ago. And Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, I, I, I thought you might be. And he said, uh, he said, God saved me out of a life of addiction. And he's, uh, my life, he said, I've been clean and 
a child of God for 14 years and I have a part in the ministry of the addiction. It was so exciting to talk with him. He had on this jacket, had a little uh, Ohio State emblem right here. And uh, after a while in the conversation, he got real somber and he said, I'm so sorry to hear about your loss. I thought he meant Beneth. And all of a sudden I'm trying to figure out, he couldn't have known her. How, what does he, I said, well, well, thank you. Thank you for your concern. He said, I meant Ohio State. I told them I was a Clemson fan. I laughed. And laughed. This is sorry for my loss. <laughs> it's so good to be here. Please open your Bibles to... Uh, <laughs> To the twelfth chapter, to, to the twelfth psalm. Um, we're so happy for the Wallace Johnson and Circle children at BJU. Uh, there's been a great group of young people from this church at BJU through the years. And the value and treasure of those who are there and in the will of God, those who might be led of God. To take what has been taught in your homes and in this ministry and continue it on in the development of their lives. You know, your, your young people will be like the people who trained them. And those four years are so vital. God has places still true to His Word that can lay a good, solid superstructure on the foundation that you have laid, a foundation of faith in their lives. And you need to find out where those places are and what they are for your children and seek the will of God because good places all have different cultures and influences and personnel. And your children will become like those people and part of that culture and that philosophy of Christian living that is inculcated into them during those four years. And you certainly do not want to send your children to somewhere that would not be right in the will of God for them. Uh, when Paul got, Saul got converted on the road to Damascus, the first thing he asked, Lord, what will you have me to do? And God sent a man named Ananias. There were many believers in Damascus. He was going there to persecute them. But there was one believer named Ananias and God appeared to him and said, Ananias, there's this guy Saul, go and talk to him and show him the next things he's supposed to do. So God has people like Ananias somewhere to help your children see the next things they're supposed to do in the life that God has planned for them. Psalm 12 and Psalm 17, and I would ask you to keep your finger in both places. We're going to look at both of these short psalms. Because each of them is a cry to God to guard us from our generation. The sociologists identify six generations starting in the mid-twenties and unto the present. They categorize them first as the GI generation, which uh, from the mid-20s up until uh, uh, the early 30s, then the silent generation. I would be part of the silent generation. And then, of course, the boomers, and then Gen X, Y, and Z, six generations roughly separated between 10 and 20 years apart. And in each of these segments, there were certain characteristics. Certain generations, like the earlier two or three, or particularly the earlier two, were characterized by marital fidelity, no divorce, uh, strong values centered around the church and the home and so forth. And then there was the first computer generation. And 
the first whatever generation. And so people in these eras, these um, segments of our American history over the last 60 or 70 years are characterized by certain values and certain distinctives that came into play in the American culture in their various lifetimes. Most of our student body right now um, would be uh, uh, Gen Y and Gen Z. Uh, so you can kind of decide what generation you think you're part of, but, but, the important thing I find in these two passages of Scripture is a cry from God's servant David to deliver us from our generation. I find this rather interesting. And I hope you will as well as we look at these passages and see what it is David's cry to God was all about. Because I have a feeling that many of you who love and know God, you have a similar cry in your heart as you look at your generation. And you see the difference between where you are in relation to how you think about life in this world and how most of them think. You find yourself in a great minority. And here's why you find yourself in a great minority. Because in each of these six living generations, there are two other generations. There's the generation of the righteous. We call, I will call that, for the sake of this day, Gen R. Each redeemed pe person in this building today is a part of Gen R. Uh, in the uh, 14th Psalm, David said, God is in the generation of the righteous, Gen R. And then there is Gen U, generation unrighteous. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says that the unrighteous shall not inherit eternal life. Gen R, God is in the generation of the righteous. And Gen U, those who are unrighteous and shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And I would say to any of you that might be here today and realize that, well, I'm in the generation of the unrighteous. I am in Gen U. I'm not a part of the kingdom of God. Christ is not my Savior. I want you to know that God wants you in Gen R. He... It is not his desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, 1 Timothy 2 says, God will have all men to be saved. That's the will of God. There is hope for you if you are here as part of the generation of the unrighteous. I like the way Isaiah puts it in Isaiah 55 verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God he will abundantly pardon. That's the welcome of a big-hearted, merciful, kind God, even the creator God of the universe, eternal God. It is not his will that you or I should perish, and he gave his son that if we would believe in him, we would have everlasting life. God the Redeemer is the seeker of your soul today. If you're part of the generation of the unrighteous. I wanted to make that very clear before proceeding further in this message. Would you please open your Bibles to Psalm 12 and let's read. Follow as I read. Here's the cry. Help, Lord. He must have been pretty extremely concerned about the generation of 
those who were not part of Jen Ahar in his day. Help, Lord. The godly man ceases and the faithful man will fail, are failing from among the children of men. The godly man is ceasing. What does that mean? Well, maybe they're dying off. Do you ever get the feeling that many of the most godly people you know are now, like your recent pastor, gone on? Maybe you have father, mother that raised you to love and desire the Lord, and they're gone on, and you look around, and the, the godly are ceasing. Well, it could mean that, or it could mean they're ceasing to be godly. Their godly influence is disappearing from the world. You don't find them in good Bible preaching churches anymore. It, maybe they used to be faithful right here. You know people that used to be faithful right here on the pews beside you, and in retirement, they went off somewhere and they retired and they're not even in church anymore and they're just, they're just burned out. The pressures of being a part of the kingdom of God but living in the kingdom of man has just withered their souls. David looks around and he says, Help, Lord, the godly man sees it and the faithful fail from among the children of men. The faithful could not only be faithful Christians, but just faithful people who, even as unsaved people, had good morals, good standards, good principles of decency and honorableness by which they lived. You may have an unsaved uh, neighbor who is probably maybe a whole lot more faithful in doing the right things than some of the Jen are people that you know. There's some mighty nice people that have some decency about them who just, they don't know Christ. That's, that's just what they need. So the psalmist is looking here with a sense of despair and deep concern. He says, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. He's speaking now about the collective kind of culture that's around him. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, with a double heart. They speak, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are not our own. Who is Lord over us? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, says the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Do you notice, my friend, that in this psalm, the concerns that are upon the heart of David about Jen Yu, the unrighteous, the concerns have nothing to do with their deeds, but with their speech. Their speech is the index that David uses in this psalm to quantify what it is about this people that makes them so corrupt and shows so clearly their corruption. Their speech. Have you ever noticed how in Gen U today, speech has become so coarse, so vulgar from our politicians and their public speaking? So debased? He said right here in this psalm, these, this generation, this Gen U of his day were speaking to their neighbors, each speaking to the other in the most uh, inappropriate ways, about the most inappropriate things. 
Have you noticed how there is a, a seething hatred in some of the speech when people refer to Bible-believing Christians? How disdainful they are, scorning about people who live and believe like you and I try to live and believe for this is what the Bible teaches us to do. Have you noticed? Have you noticed by uh, the product of the secular school classrooms from all grades, lowest to highest, have you noticed how the output from these schools has produced a Bible-denying, God-denying, uh, completely secular generation that has no time for anything that is eternal, has no appreciation for what God's people and the church in America have meant to this nation from its very founding. They scorn at the idea. There's a blackout in what they are speaking about our wonderful history. And a whole generation has been raised because the speech of the classrooms is so lacking in truth in so many cases. How they have taught that with their speech that man is an animal and when he dies he goes to the dust like a dog and he ceases to be and so we have a generation because they've, they think they're animals, they're living like animals. Have you noticed the effect of the speech of the classrooms of America? On your children? What about the newsrooms? These people with their godless agenda. How they are so careful not to speak about what God is doing in this world and, and, and the, the good things that happen to a life that is regenerated and, and how homes are put back together and how lives are lived in a more noble and refined and decent way and how they treat, redeemed treat people because they are redeemed for the sake of the Savior, how everything is different after the new birth. And have you noticed how in public speaking there is no time or appreciation for any of that? Have you been reading or heard of the corrupted pulpits that are all around you here in this part of the world that used to speak God's truth, that now speak lies to their people and tell them that man is basically good and basically decent and he can pull himself up out of the mire and the mess of his life and he can reconstruct himself and he can bring in the kingdom of God to this world. We just get enough education and we're just going to all somehow morph into something a whole lot better than we are. Ridiculous message. The lying promises of the elected officials the corrupted justice of the courts, the vanity of the social media. Have you noticed that the speech of Jin Yu is having a most deleterious effect upon this nation? Well, David had noticed that upon his own nation and his own people. And there was a real problem. The godly had ceased and the faithful had failed. And did you notice that when this happens, David says in verse 8, that the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted, when the vilest men are elected or put on court benches or in classrooms, places of influence. Have you noticed what happens when we're surrounded by the vilest of men. Jen R. needs God's preservation and protection from the proud speaking, flattering lips of the hypocritical hearts that are part of Jen U. If this bothers you, if, 
if Jen Yu and their speech and their philosophies that they're speaking, you see what is happening, you see they're hypocritical, they're, they're, they're double-hearted. They'll say one thing meaning something completely different, completely untrustworthy. Have you noticed how the words of the opinion makers and the leaders and through them the public at large has created a world in which righteousness and the righteous becomes objects of persecution, ostracism, discrimination. You are discriminated against by the words of the influencers of this generation. You're persecuted, you're put in a corner of society. They would just like to seal us off back there. So what David is crying for here is a cry for protection. But I like what he says in verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Pure words, like the finest of silver, the purest. What a contrast between the words of the righteous, Jen R, and the words of Jen Yu. And David's heart was very concerned, and he cried to God, Preserve us from this generation, from Jen Yu. Then turn, if you will, to Psalm 17. The first verse, he begins again. Hear the right, O Lord, attend to my cry, give ear to my prayer that goes not out of unfeigned lips. And then verse 9, he's crying again. Still, from the wicked that oppress me, from the deadly enemies who compass me about. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. He's still concerned about the speaking, but there's something more here you'll see. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth like as a lion that is greedy of his prey and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword, from men who are thy hand, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life, whose belly thou fillest with hid treasure. They are full of children. They leave the rest of their substance to their babes. But as for me... Part of Jen R. I will uphold, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. What is he concerned about here? It is not their, the corruption of their speech that is so destructive to their generation but it is for deliverance from the moral wickedness of Jen Yu. Verse 9, he speaks about the wicked. In the Hebrew, I am told that the word we have in English, wicked, means morally wicked. God, deliver us in Jen R from the kind of world and what it means for us and our families that is being created by Jen Yu. Lord, this generation, this morally wicked generation is taking a toll on us. And is it not true? David said, these men, these morally wicked men, verse 7, they rise up against those who put their trust in God, he said. God, deliver us from what this generation is trying to do to us by the proliferation of their moral wickedness. 
It is natural to them to live this way. You know, when the Apostle Paul was taking the gospel all through his missionary journeys, the pagans that got saved got saved out of the most miry swamp of immorality that maybe has existed in the world until now. <laughs> there were seven different Greek words to describe seven different kinds of sexual immorality. And these pagans that got saved, they came out of what was so natural to them in that world, the Gen U world. Natural to swap wives. Natural to accept homosexuality or practice homosexuality or it was all they knew. It was their life. It was natural. They didn't think anything about it. There was no guilty conscience. And so it is with all in Gen U in any time of history. It was true in David's day. And these, this Gen U was just morally wicked. And you know, they don't like people who are, by God's grace, morally upright. They don't like that. It's a rebuke. Somehow they're uncomfortable. Just as you and I are uncomfortable around them, they are uncomfortable around us. If we have the right kind of testimony. David called them deadly enemies who compass or encircle us or seal us off. You know, if, if, if a Christian has the right testimony in the world at large, in his neighborhood, in his workplace, if he has the right kind of testimony, in order to stay right with God the best we know how, we don't really have to separate from those people. They, they don't want us anywhere near them. Nor should they. Nor should we want to be there in that kind of... To be near them, yes, to reach them. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is for a church like this to feel so uncomfortable around Gen U that you don't sit down to eat with them and speak to them about the Savior. The Lord ate with sinners. So must we. We're to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every creature, not isolate from the world. But, but the truth is, we realize that Gen U is producing a culture around us that takes a terrible toll on our minds, our hearts, and on our children. Pornography is just pouring out through the social media. You can hardly, you can hardly watch a Hollywood film that is not so filled with words that are so offensive to the people of God. You can just hardly stand it or, or themes or scenes. And the output of Gen U is, it's natural for the people of God to do what David did. Lord, help us. What are we coming to? The speech of the morally wicked man or woman is proud speech. Look at verse 10. With their mouth, they speak proudly. They're proud of their sin. They're proud of their life. They're proud of the world that they are creating. And we look at it and say, Lord, thank you for saving me. I was in that world too, and you rescued me. And don't let me ever get hard. Give me a compassion toward those who are still in that world, Lord. 
You can rescue them just like you rescued me. My friends, God is so marvelously kind and mightily capable of taking care of Jen R when Jen U makes life so difficult for us in this world. Look at it in verse 7. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those who rise up against them. Lord, you're so kind. You can rescue us. You can keep us because we're the apple of your eye. You care about us. You know this kind of world. You came into this world and you lived a sinless life in this world. You were tempted in every way we're tempted. You understand what we're up against. And Lord, don't let Jen you make me think that that life is normal and is, could ever be normal for me as a citizen of the kingdom of God. They go about like greedy lions to prey upon us, to intimidate us, to marginalize us, to seal us off from any kind of influence, from any kind of high office, from any kind of place, teaching classroom or anywhere else we could influence anybody for Christ. They don't want us to have the freedoms to do that like a lion after a prey. They encircle us. Some years ago, uh, I was in uh, South Africa and the missionary took my wife and me out to a game park. And one morning, we, we lived in the game park in an enclosed, safe place. And, and we went out one morning early and we were on a little rise and down here was a, was a pond. And there were about six impala uh, drinking uh, there at that water. But on the little rise beyond it, there was a lion and two lionesses and they had formed a pincer movement. There was the giraffe over here was standing just like this, scared to death, didn't want the lion to see him. He was interesting to watch. And little by little, the male lion would move and then the lionesses would move and they were in a kind of a circling thing like this and they moved and they would stop and you could see the Impala, nervous, they knew something was going on and, and all of a sudden the male lion decided to charge and the lionesses charged and came and the Impala ran and they escaped on a little isthmus that took them around the edge of the pond and to some land beyond and, and all the lions could do was lie down and pant. They're not built for the long haul. But that image comes to my mind as I read this passage of scripture like these, these lions encircle the people of God. That's the method of Gen U around the people of God. So David prayed, Lord, deliver us. Just don't let them corrupt us. How is it, my friend, in closing, how is it that we can be uncorrupted in the midst of Gen U. I think very clearly, according to the sixth verse of Psalm 12 that we read, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace. To remain increasingly and confidently acquainted with the Word of God, which sets our thinking straight, keeps our perspective from becoming the perspective of Gen U, keeping our students out of the classrooms to be affected by the thinking and perspective about life being promoted in Gen U, being in a good Bible preaching church where the pulpit helps us through the preaching of the Word of God to keep our perspective right and biblically centered and Christ honoring that we might be honorable men and women of God. And then secondly, to remain increasingly mindful and encouraged, knowing that life in this world is not the only life we're going to have. Look again at verse 15 of 17. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I will be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. My friend, you and God make a majority in any situation. That's what my grandfather used to teach us. 
I know you feel if you are Godward thinking person, I just am miserable in this world. But don't ever be self-righteous about it. Be thankful for your deliverance through the blood of Christ. God has put us here. This is our home right now. He intends for us to be here in the midst of all the discomfort. And if you don't feel uncomfortable in, gym, in the midst of Jim, you, there's something wrong. You feel uncomfortable in the midst of this. And you're like David, you just, you just cry to God. This, this, this world is just getting so bad. Yes, it, it, it is. And... It's not half what it's going to be before the Lord extracts us from it. But you and God make a, major, uh, a majority. You don't have to be in the, minority, in the majority of where this generation is. You should not be in the majority of this generation. You're a part of the kingdom of heaven in the midst of a foreign culture. And you and God make a majority. You are in the numerical minority, but you are in the majority because he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Heavenly Father, give us understanding from this scripture today what we're up against, why we're so uncomfortable. Lord, you've heard the cry of many in this room today. God, will you deliver us? Will you help us? The world is so sinfully corrupted. It's, it's like Sodom and Gomorrah. You've put us here. And you are our deliverance. So, dear God, let us never give up being faithful and trying to be godly. Never let us be proud that we are part of Gen R. Never let us lose sight that it's only by your grace that we're there and we have a mission to those who are part of Gen U to tell them of your loving, compassionate desire that they should not perish. Give us quiet hearts in the midst of our distress, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you very much. I think my battery is dead down there on the floor, but um, thank you, Dr. Bob, for the message from David's generation to our generation. It's the same, isn't it? It's the same. I've preached that passage, Psalm 12, 1, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. He cried out, and maybe you feel like that. There's been a lot of desperation, been a lot of hopelessness out there. You know what, folks? We don't have to be that way, right? We don't have to be that way. God is still on the throne, and I appreciate the encouragement from the Word of God from these two chapters in Psalms today. Thank you, Dr. Bob, very, very much. I'm going to have you and your wife go out to the lobby. I'll meet you there in just a second. If you are visiting with us, why don't you uh, stop by and let us greet you in the lobby and get to know you a little bit better. Um, be back at 6 o'clock tonight, if you would, please. Another message from God's Word. I know it will challenge your heart and encourage you as well. And I hope that you'll be in attendance for that. All right. I'll ask Dr. Way if he'll close us in a word of prayer, please. And then we'll have our final song with Pastor Halleck. Saved by his power divine. Have a blessed afternoon. Look forward to seeing you back tonight.